If you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Today is a historic day for Sovereign Grace Church of Gilbert and Grace Church of Peoria. Everything changes today. Two bodies of believers become, one body of believers becomes two, and we anticipate the result of this, that the gospel will go forward again now throughout Gilbert and also in the Northwest Valley of this great city. It's at these moments in life, it's at these kind of moments where we feel like we're standing on the top of a mountain and we're about to leap off. We find ourselves with one foot between two worlds for one last time. It's at these kinds of moments that we take stock And we look back, and we remember, and we ask the obvious question, how did we get here? We look back at many moments that have directed the shape of our life, the course of our life. We see the sovereign hand of God at work as we recount how we got here. Tara took me on one of the best trips of my life at the end of the pastor's college. I grew up about four hours north of Gaithersburg, Maryland, and a very little city, I don't know, not a city, it's a town, 5,000 people, whatever that is, it was small, in the middle of central Pennsylvania, and Tara had surprised me the last week of school. She had arranged with the dean to excuse my absence and forgive my homework for not being there, and she had planned this trip, and she took me back to my old hometown to a bed and breakfast that they built after I had left, literally on my street, at the end of my street, in this town of 5,000 people. I left Montoursville as an eight-year-old child. It had been 20 years since I had seen the landscape, since I had seen my old stomping grounds. And much to my surprise and delight, when I got there, not much had changed. Now, bear in mind, I, was an, I have eight-year-old memories. And so my house seemed huge, my backyard seemed huge, and now I look at it and I, I think, wow, this, th- that part has changed, but not much has changed in terms of the landscape. We drove around and saw my old elementary school, we saw my old house, we saw familiar landmarks, I saw buildings with the names of people that I remember going to school with in elementary school, people's names up on car dealerships and whatnot. And at one point, we turned down a dirt road that I had turned down a thousand times before. And about a thousand different memories came flooding back to my brain. And we pulled up to this little outdoor, in the middle of a forest, community pool that was right where I left it 20 years ago. This was the pool that I learned to swim in. This was the pool that I, that my dad became my first coach. This was the pool that I swam my first lap all the way across. This pool, this pool was the beginning of hundreds of meets and thousands of miles and hundreds and thousands of hours of training from an eight-year-old until a man who swam in college. It stretched throughout high school. It stretched all the way to the University of Denver. This pool was the beginning of my swimming career that lasted almost 12 years until it came into an abrupt halt my second year at the University of Denver for various reasons. And it was at this point in my life where my swimming career ended and I found a new career. I found the Lord Jesus Christ. I believed. I believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Savior of my sins. I believe that Jesus had, in fact, come in the flesh to this earth as a means of provision from God to us so that sinners do not have to go to hell for eternity apart from God, but instead can be with him forever and experience the blessing of relationship with God. It was at this point that I realized I had lived my entire life as a sinner, and no matter how many scholarships I had, no no matter how good my grades were, No matter how cleaned up I looked on the outside, there is no one good compared to the goodness of God. All have sinned and fallen short 
of his glory. And the Lord convicted me, and the Lord called me, and the Lord saved me. And so this wasn't any ordinary pool. This pool that I looked at was the beginning of how I got here. Our passage this morning is Matthew 28, 16 through 20, really 18 through 20. And as we look at this passage, and we consider this moment in redemptive history, it appears as if God has been at work long before that pool Long before that day in Denver, long before any of us were even born, to bring about his purpose in our lives. God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for Sovereign Grace Church, and he has a purpose for Grace Church of Peoria that has existed since before the creation of the world. And we discover what it is as we study Matthew 28, 16 through 20. If you could please stand We're going to read the scripture together. This is the word of the Lord. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. Go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you Always to the end of the age. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we stand before your word and we consider, Lord, this day, we consider, Lord, the, the call to plant this church, Lord, we are in awe of you. Because, Lord, we know that from you, And through you and for you, Lord, are all things. And we want to declare from the outset that Sovereign Grace Church in Gilbert exists for you, and Grace Church of Peoria exists for you and for your glory. Let this day, Lord, be marked by your glory. This is not about man, but about you and what you've come to do in this world. So bless the preaching time now. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, give us ears to hear. And Lord, more than that, give us hearts to believe today. All that you have commanded us, particularly from this scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may find your seats. We have two points this morning. The first is God's mission. The first this morning is God's mission. We come to this passage. It's known as the great commissioning of the disciples. And we know if you've read this passage that Jesus is sending off his disciples to do a work. And we can immediately jump to the implications. We can come to Matthew 28 and begin with, what are we called to do? Where are we called to go? What has God asked of us? But that must not be the place we start in Matthew 28. That's our second point this morning. Our first point is God's mission. See, we don't start with the disciples' mandate. We start with the purposes of God, which have been proclaimed throughout the whole Old Testament. All of the Old Testament leads up to this point at Matthew 28. And when we read the Old Testament, we find that God is on a mission. God is on a cosmic rescue mission to redeem people from their sins for his glory's sake, and for the good of his creation. We read in Genesis 1 and 2, God speaks words. He speaks words into nothingness. And things appear. And God begins to create. And after every moment of creation, he says, this is good, this is good, but 
He comes to his prized possession. He comes to the peak of his creation. He comes to man. And he declares it to be very good. Man is the only creation that has been indelibly stamped with the divine image of God. No other creation has this divine image impressed upon it the way that mankind is. And so as God creates, he says, it is very good. Genesis 3, man rebels and throws away communion with God. Man rebels against God's loving rule and decides not just to break God's law, but to become the makers of law themselves. Adam and Eve become the deciders of what is good and what is bad in their own sight. And they reject God. They reject his words. They reject communion with him for sin. And in this rejection, they reject more than just communion for themselves. They reject more than just the fellowship that they personally had. They reject it for every child that would ever come underneath them. They stand as the representatives of all the world. And so now, everyone who lives is under the curse of of sin. And the evidence of that curse is that everyone dies. If you keep reading in Genesis, you see the genealogies after Adam, and they come. Each one ends with the little phrase, and he died. And he died. And he died. The effects of sin on human race is that we die. That's the evidence that creation has been tragically damaged. If we stop at Genesis 3, it would seem as if all is lost. And yet, all is not lost because God, almost immediately after this, proclaims a mission. A mission to redeem, a mission to renew, a mission to bless out of destruction. Christopher Seeds writes, Mission is the address of God's blessing to the deficit brought about by human failure and pride. Mission is God's plan to bring blessing out of destruction. And so he begins, he begins to plan the redemption and to execute the redemption that he laid out from before the beginning of time. He's laying out a plan to deal with the penalty of sin. He's laying out a plan to deal with the power and effects of sin. He does so by selecting he does, begins to plan so by begins to selecting begins to plan begins to plan begins to plan he does, begins to plan so by begins to plan selecting begins to plan begins to plan begins to plan he does in pride does so by in pride selecting pride in in pride in pride he does in pride does so by in pride selecting pride in in pride in pride he does in pride does so by Christ selecting Christine Christ Christ he does Christ does so by Christ selecting Christine Christ Christ he does. Christ does so by Christ selecting immediately. 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 He does. Immediately does so by immediately selecting. Immediately. 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 He does. Immediately does so by immediately selecting. Nation has been. Nation has been. Nation has been. He does. Nation has been. Does so by nation has been selecting. Nation has been. Nation has been. Nation has been. He does. Nation has been. Does so by nation has been selecting. Nation has been. And he. And he. He does. And he does so by and he selecting. And he. And he. And he. He does, and he does so by that he selecting and he reading in Jen reading in Jen he does reading in Jesso by reading in Jen selecting reading in Jen reading in Jen reading in Jen he does reading in Jesso by reading in Jen selecting reading in Jen reading in Jen the world he does the world does so by the world selecting the world the world the world he does the world does so by the world selecting the world the world the world he does so by selecting he does so by selecting. He does so by peak of his selecting. Peak of his peak of his peak of his. He does peak of his does so by peak of his selecting. Peak of his peak of his peak of his. He does peak of his does so by no one selecting. No one. No one. No one. He does. No one does so by no one selecting. No one. No one. No one. He does. No one does so by no one selecting. He does so by selecting. He does so by selecting. To break, ought to break. He does to break. He does to break. Selecting. Ought to break. Ought to break. Ought to break. 
He does to break so by off to break selecting off to break off they were off they were he does they were does so by him they were selecting words they were doing them they were words they were he does him they were does so by words they were selecting them they were doing words they were them he does does so by selecting he does does so by selecting he does underneath does so by underneath selecting underneath 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 he does underneath does so by underneath selecting underneath 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 he does so by selecting he does so by selecting he does so by matter how selecting matter how matter how matter how he does matter how so by matter how selecting matter how matter how matter how he does matter how so by matter how selecting he does, does so by <laughs> blessing must deal with sin. Blessing must deal with rebellion. Blessing must deal with distance between God and his people, or it is no blessing at all. Sin is the fundamental problem of people. Wrath is the fundamental consequence of people's sin. And so this blessing has to deal with sin. How can people who repeatedly reject God, his word, his commandments, his ways, his life, how can those people, who is everyone, including his chosen people, Israel, how can those people be blessed with relationship with God like it was in the beginning? One way. The mission of God sends Jesus. God sends Jesus. God sends the Son of Man to come in the likeness of sinful men. He sends the true offspring of Abraham. He sends the one through whom the blessing will come, Galatians 3 says. He sends the second Adam, Romans 5, to succeed where Adam failed. He sends Jesus to perfectly fulfill and obey the law that Adam and everyone since has not kept and to die in the place of sinners. He sent Jesus as the culmination of the mission that began all the way back in Genesis 3. He sent him to take our place. He sent him as the innocent sacrifice. He sent him to bear the wrath for our sins. Listen, if Jesus does not come, every person will die, and every person will stand before God as judge. And the judge on that day will say over your name and over my name, guilty as charged. There is no escape from God's righteous judgment were Jesus not to come. But he came. Century upon century upon century anticipated the one who would come and redeem, the one who would come and restore the one who would be the Messiah. Jesus is that one. And he lives his life in perfect obedience to God, following his will all the way to the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweats blood as he cries out to God, if there's any other way to accomplish this mission, please let this cup pass. And there is no other way. And so Christ goes to the cross for you and for me and for all who place their faith in him. And he hangs on that cross and he suffers the penalty for our sins and he declares with a loud voice, it is finished. And what he means is it has been accomplished. The mission of God has been accomplished. Once and for all, wrath has been put away, sin has been dealt with, death has been conquered by the risen Christ. It is finished. If you're here and you're looking for the answers to life, let me tell you, Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the story. Jesus Christ is what all human history hangs on. Creation is being recreated in Christ. Finally, Finally, relationship with God can be had once again. 
Brothers and sisters, this is good news. This is the great news of the good news. We can have relationship with God again and forever. It has been accomplished, and yet there's one last stage to fulfill, and that's to bring this news to all the nations. God's mission accomplished. This is where our mission begins. Point two is our mission. This passage is clear. We are to go. We're to go. Verse 17 says, go and make disciples of all nations. You can hear the language of Genesis being picked up into this commission. Go into all the nations and bring this blessing that I have accomplished and fulfilled on the cross. Bring it to those who don't know me. The promise of Abraham is being fulfilled in Christ and being expanded through our mission. He set in motion the beginning of church planting. The disciples hear these words. You read the book of Acts. They begin to go and they establish and plant local churches. The call is to go. Now, it's easy to stand here today and say with conviction, Grace Church is called to go. Because we are. We are called to go. But that would seem to imply that the rest of you are called to stay. And geographically speaking, that's true. Not everyone is called to geographically go. That would defeat the point of starting local churches where people can be brought into. Some are called to stay and go. And some are called to leave and go. On this day, as we consider the mission, in terms of this mission, everyone is called to go. Every one of us is called to go. Whether you're staying or whether you're leaving, all of us are called to go. Because this mission wasn't just for church plants. This mission wasn't just for a small group of people. This mission can only be fulfilled to the ends of the earth if we all play our part. Every local church that's ever been established is called to fulfill this great commission in their locale. And you can read, as Paul plants these churches in the book of Acts, and people are responding to the message of Christ, they're not only being won by the mission, they're being won into the mission. They become partners of the mission. They're not just recipients, they become participants in this great commission to go where they are. In fact, the word here, go, in the Greek, literally means having gone. The assumption is having gone, all of us having gone, so we're all called to go. The mission is for all of us. The mission is to bring the blessing of the gospel to the surrounding world and to our community. So on this day, as some of us leave and many of us, us stay, all are called to go. We go in three ways from this text. First, we go with power. We go with power. Read verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority, this word authority can be translated power to act. All power to act has been given to me. Now these disciples have seen his power to act. They've walked with him intimately for three years. They've seen him heal. They've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him prophesy. They've seen him teach with such power and such authority that the crowds are astonished. They've seen his power to act, but nothing testified to this power as much as standing before the risen Christ. Remember, in context, Jesus was just crucified. And he's alive. And he's standing before them. And he's telling them, all authority, all power to act has been given to me. And they're like, we know. We can look. We can see. You're alive. He rules and reigns over Death. What kind of audacious claim would this be? 
to claim that you have all power in heaven and on earth. I don't think they doubted. As they stood before the risen Christ, because all authority and all power truly was his. He earned it. He rose from the dead. He accomplished the mission. He's been crowned the king of the cosmos. He's alive. Now that's amazing. That's amazing. There's no one, there's no one who can stop Christ. There's nothing that can stop Christ. Think about how much more amazing it is that this authority is the basis for our commission. He says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Go, therefore. Go, therefore, on the basis of this authority, go. And so we can confidently say today, we go with power. We go with power. Not our power, but we go with the power of the risen Christ. The power of from the one who has all power and authority over every nation, every city, every soul. It's his power that propels us forward. And listen, if Satan cannot stop him, if sin cannot stop him, if death cannot stop him, there's nothing that can stop Christ and his gospel. We go with power, ready to explode like light into a darkened world. We stayed an extra day at the leaders' conference this last April, and we took Taylor to the Smithsonian Museum. And I snuck away for a few minutes, and I went to a science section. And they described the process of a nuclear reaction, which quite honestly, to that point, I had no clue how that worked. Well, here's how it works. As the nucleus of an atom splits apart, neutrons are released, and they connect with other atoms, and they bounce other neutrons off, picking up energy, and they bounce into other atoms that release neutrons. And if you get a bunch of these together in a small space, you create this seriously powerful explosion, this chain reaction. And we've all seen pictures of what this kind of power can do. It's devastating. It can wipe out an entire city. Redemptively speaking, Christ has far greater power to do the same through the gospel. The gospel devastates if you love sin. The gospel wipes clean all the guilt of your crimes. The gospel is like exploding power. In fact, in other places in Scripture, it's called the power of God unto salvation. That word is is dunamai, it's dynamite. It has this explosive quality to it. This is the power that we all have in the gospel because the power is in the message of the gospel. This should give us rock-solid confidence this morning to preach the gospel, to press it forward into people's lives because this power is ours. I know that we're walking through difficult times. I know you're walking through difficult times. I know that there's difficult times in this country. There's difficult times in your life. There's difficult times in this church. And I understand that as you look around, it's easy to be tempted, to be discouraged. It's easy to set your focus on what's not instead of what is. But let me remind you this morning, I understand that. But at the end of our lives, at the end of my life, I don't want to be guilty of looking back and having tasted the power of God in a thimble size. I want more than that. I want more than that for my life. I want more than that from your life. The power is ours. I want to believe as we sang today that he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. This power is the gospel. It's the power to forgive. It's the power to be bold. It's the power to be courageous. It's the power to be holy. It's the power to live in community. I want this power. I want to live with this power. I do not want to look at the back of my life on wasted years where I did not use this power that is within the gospel. I want us to know Jesus Christ 
and the power of his resurrection, as Philippians says, to share in his sufferings so that we might become like him in his death and testify to the resurrection power of the gospel. I want you to want that too. I believe you do want that. So Sovereign Grace Church, Grace Church of Peoria, we have a mission. We have a mission. God had a mission. We have a mission. Let's fulfill the mission. Let's not be distracted. Let's look up. And let's go forward. And let's bring the gospel as we go. We go with power. Secondly, we go with purpose. We go with purpose. We go with his purpose. We believe that as we go, God will, in fact, give us boldness and strength and power to do. Like an army that's been trained, like an army that's been equipped with weapons in hand, being dropped off on the battlefield, the only question is, what is the assignment? What is the task that we're to give ourselves to? How do we know if we're hitting the mark? Well, we can see in verse 19, our marching orders. Go, having gone, therefore, make disciples. The call is to make disciples. The blessing of Abraham is going to come to those who have been made disciples. If you are a disciple of Christ, you're receiving the blessing of Abraham. Relationship with God. And so as we go, this is the mission we're called to. Isn't it great that we don't have to start from scratch and figure it out? We don't start with a blank slate. We don't start with a clean easel. We don't have to creatively brainstorm. What are we supposed to do? We're called to make disciples. We're called to be about God's mission. It's not about our mission. It's about his mission. We get to play a role in fulfilling his mission. How amazing is that? We're called to fulfill the purpose that drove him to lay down his life. Making disciples requires two in this text. According to verse 19, evangelism and instruction. Evangelism. See, it says here, we're to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we baptize those who come to know Christ. And so implicit within this text is the call to evangelize. We're called to share this gospel with others. And like I said, moreover, even this text, the entire Bible is calling us to share the gospel because only the gospel can produce a worshiper of Christ. Only the gospel can produce a disciple who worships and loves and serves and receives forgiveness and begins to love God. Which means at its core, to be gospel-centered is to be mission-centered. As much as it is to be centered on growth and sanctification. That's why you might hear the word missional being used a lot in recent years. To live missionally is to live as one who has a mission. That makes sense? To live as one who has a purpose within a culture. To live as one who has a purpose to spread the gospel to those you come in contact with. I think this is a legitimate use of this word. I think there's strength in thinking about ourselves as one with a mission. As one who, whose life and work and neighborhood, and job, and friends, and relationships is not isolated from the task of evangelism, but is, in fact, a part of your evangelism. In Acts 2.42, this is amazing. You see the early church, and you might know this verse by heart, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayers. Such a great verse on what the local church looks like what relationships look like day in and day out amongst a body of believers. But notice the framework in which it sits. In verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So as the church lives, as the church relates, as the church is the church, God adds to our numbers those who are being saved. The testimony of the gospel goes forward. Is that how you see evangelism? Is evangelism something you check off the box? I read my Bible. I prayed. A few months ago, I talked to that guy briefly about church. I didn't really share the gospel with him, but... Or do you see evangelism as a part of the mission that your whole life is called to? Is it a part of your identity? Is it a part of your identity as a disciple of Christ? 
Because it was for Jesus, it was for his followers in the early church. Tim Chester and Steve Timmis say, most gospel ministry involves ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality. So we go with purpose. We go with intentionality. We go with a mission to share the gospel. Please consider how you view your life. Are you about your mission, whatever that is, or are you about what God has called you to in this text? As Tara and I talked about leaving Sovereign Grace Church, some of the things that we would miss the most among many. And I think it's clear for both of us that I think the things we're going to miss the most in this church in terms of the the moments and the events that we've experienced together with you as a body, baptism Sundays at this church, we're going to miss. Now I hope, pray, and believe that God's going to give us baptism Sundays in Peoria. But those Sundays when numbers of you have been up on this stage and you've had the courage to confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's evidence to the fact that you all are playing your part in the mission and that God is playing his part to his mission and proving himself faithful over and over and over again and throughout Life 101 to see people come who don't know Christ, to see the gospel proclaimed, to see those of you here who have been saved through this ministry. I want more of that. That's what we're going to miss amongst many other things. So whether you're going or whether you're staying, let's go. Let's go with power. Let's go with purpose. Let's go. Let's see people reach. Let's see people baptized. Let's be missional. But missional living does not only end with evangelism. It's only a part. There's another aspect to making disciples beyond evangelism and celebration of baptism. It's in verse 20. It's instruction. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So it's great to be missional because we have a mission, but missional living doesn't just mean evangelism. It also means discipleship. It also means teaching. It also means instruction. Faithful instructions to new converts who are called to obey. The call to obey. We're called to obey as disciples who have been won into this mission. And we're calling them to obey all that Jesus commanded them. And so implied in this text We must teach. We must teach. And I'm grateful to God for Rich and for this team for teaching us. For teaching us week after week, Sunday after Sunday, proclaiming verse by verse through the Bible all that Jesus has commanded us. Because apart from teaching, how do we know what to obey? Thank you, Rich. Thank you, John. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Trey. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for teaching this body helping us to fulfill this mission. We're not just teaching good tips. We're not teaching inspirational platitudes. We're teaching the Bible. And so, church, we must study the Bible. We must love the Bible. We must know the Bible. We must meditate on the Bible. We must memorize the Bible. We must talk about the Bible. Because the Bible is God's revelation to us of the gospel. And I'm so grateful that this is a church that loves God's word. Not only, is, not only am I grateful that the team teaches, but this passage means that you're called to teach as well. Your life is called to teach. As you come into contact with new converts, as you come into contact with the lost, as you come into contact with those who are wondering about who God is, it's not just the pastor's job. It's your job to teach. It's your job to disciple. It's your job to apply the gospel to their lives. That's as much missional living as it is to go preach. They're hand in hand. We must win people by the mission, into the mission, and the full mission of God includes a full commitment to obedience to God. And so the question for you is, what is your life teaching today? Is your life communicating the truth about who God is? This is done in community. This is a community project. Evangelism, discipleship, instruction takes place in a community. It's called the local church. It's a context where we can know each other. It's a context where we can lock arms together to fulfill this mission. 
It's the place where you bring your unbelieving friends to hear the gospel. The church body is where you call another couple in to help you with your marriage. It's a place where you confess your sins. It's a place where you remember the grace of God in your life. It's a place where you encourage and spur one another on to good works. It's a place where you pray together with others. This is why Sovereign Grace Church exists. And this is why Grace Church of Peoria now exists. To fulfill this mission. Until every person is born again, and every person has reached the fullness of maturity in Christ, we're all called to go and make disciples and bring the blessing of the gospel to the unbelieving worlds. We go with power. We go with his purpose. And lastly, we go with promise. We go with a wonderful, amazing promise from God. Listen, whether you're staying whether you're leaving, as we all go, going is scary. Going is scary. Going represents risk. Going opens you up to failure. Going opens you up to pain. Going means you might suffer. Going means you might be walking right into the midst of a trial. Going is scary. I've had a number of people ask me how I'm feeling this morning about this church plant. And it's funny because a number of people have asked, are you scared? And let me just say, as the leader of this church plant, I am scared. And if you're not scared, you're not paying attention. Because what we're attempting to do in one sense, in one real sense, is push back the gates of hell. Please don't make the mistake to think this is going to come easy. Don't make the mistake to think that this is going to come without cost. Going is scary. Jesus knows how scary this is. And yet he asks. Yet he commands. I imagine these original disciples standing there before Christ, the risen Christ, the one who has all power and authority. And I can imagine as they're listening to these words, They're feeling some of the same things I'm feeling that maybe you're feeling this morning. I mean, yeah, they have the keys of life in their hands. But at the same time, they're leaving everything that's familiar. They're leaving people that they love. They're leaving houses. They're leaving jobs in some cases. To go to a future that is not exactly defined for them. Jesus knows. Jesus knows that somewhere after these two verses sink in, that they would have doubts, that they would have fears, that they would start to count the cost, that they would consider the pain, that they would evaluate the risk. And he knows. He knows our challenges. He knows our doubts. He knows our needs. He cannot promise that it will be a success in the eyes of the world. He cannot promise that it will be free from trial. He cannot promise that it will not take sacrifice. He cannot promise that there will be no pain. He cannot promise that there will be no suffering or persecution because he knows there, in fact, will be. He can't make any of these promises to us. But there is one thing, one promise that he can give to steady the shaking knees. Behold, I am with you always. And lest you Doubt how long always is, even to the end of the age. He's with us. He's with us. Could there be a better promise? He's with us. 
He's going with us. There's no trial we can face that will cause him to break this promise. When we suffer, he's with us. When we face opposition, he's with us. When we're persecuted for our faith, he's with us. When we face trial after trial, he's with us. When we face disappointment, he's with us. And being with us, we testify to the life-giving power of this gospel. He's with us always, it says. And so if God is with us, and if his mission is for us, what shall we fear? What can befall us that does not take place on his active watch and care? My tire blew out on the I-10 freeway a few weeks ago. Nine o'clock at night, had all the kids with me, had left Tara at home just for a night off, driving back from Gilbert to Peoria. I was talking to Tara on the cell phone, and the car began to shake and swerve like I was going to get launched off to the moon. And by God's grace, I was able to hold the van steady in line for long enough to let the HOV traffic slow down and let me over. And it all happened in a matter of seconds, just instinct. I was, in some ways, didn't even know if there were cars there or not. Just pull over and try to get off and not get us killed. And I'm sitting there as we've come to a stop, and I'm sweating bullets. And the first thought I have is to comfort my kids, who must be freaking out at this moment. And Taylor is in the back, asleep. And Trevor and Riley are laughing, playing games together. They had no idea that anything had gone wrong. We have the promise that as long as this mission is ours, no matter how much the car shakes or swerves, no matter what debris is in our way, we have the captain right there with us, protecting us, empowering us, providing for us, sustaining us to do what he's called us to do. He promises to walk with us through the trials and the suffering and the pain and the risk and the cost. It's a promise. We can read about it in the book of Acts. He's there. He's with them. He's with Peter as Peter stands before the council and says, we must obey God. He's with them as he preaches his first message to the crowd. He's with them as they're persecuted over and over again. He's with Paul in the cell after Paul's been beaten multiple times saying, do not be afraid. I have more for you to do. He opens jailers' cells. He causes earthquakes. He is always with us. In the last 2,000 years, The church is filled with stories of God's present help in times of trouble. We're called to go. We're called to go, and as we go, let's go with courage. Let's go with faith. Let's go with boldness, because you know what? Faith comes in the doing. God will meet you, and God will meet us in the doing. And one day, the doing will be done. One day, the mission will be over. Christ will come to perfect his bride. And he will always be with us into the end of the age and into the next. Christ's promise is for eternal presence with his people. So let's go with courage and faith and expectation that God has greater things yet to be done in this city. In Sovereign Grace Church, and in Grace Church of Peoria and beyond. Before I pray, if I don't take this moment now, I will never have it again. And so bear with me, I've gone long. It's my last day. Man, someone stole the tissue. That was cruel. Just keep that right here. Rich and Steve, I'm grateful for you. The church, 
may not know this, but you two men stepped into my life and during a very difficult season at a prior church when I needed help. I wasn't connected with Sovereign Grace. I wasn't affiliated in any way. And you didn't care. And you were not seeking to recruit me. You were, not see- you were seeking to help <laughs> a man who needed a lot of help. And you met with me and you counseled me and you two men helped me get through the darkest time of my life. And I'm grateful to God for you for that. No strings attached. I'm grateful to God for, the, for your investment in that season of my life. After that, you took a chance on me to send me to the pastor's college. And I'm grateful to God that though this church at that time didn't know me, and though I didn't know this church, you were willing to take that chance. Rich, thank you. Thank you for risking taking a chance on me. Five years later, I look back on the decisions and the moments that have shaped and directed my life like that pool, and I I think about that. And I would not be here if it was not for you. And if it was not for you, I'm grateful to God for both of you. I want you to know that I know that. I'm grateful. To the pastoral team. To serve with you has been a joy. You have taught me how to pastor. You're some of the finest men I know. Your public ministry is exceeded by your private ministry. And I can commend these men to you, church, that these are men I believe in. These are men that I trust. These are men that I love. I've seen them up close and personal in many difficult moments. And they bear the marks of Jesus in their lives. I would follow you into war. And I'll add as Glenn did that I'll follow Wayne first. (laughs) And I hope we do have war together as partners in the gospel. To this church, Soften Grace Church, and particularly to the singles who I've had the privilege to minister to over the last five years. (sighs) You have my love and my affection. It has been, words aren't sufficient, it has been a privilege I've, I've, I've awoken many days asking, how did I get the privilege to pastor you? Seriously. You have Tara's and my respect. You have our deep love. Where there's been fruit in your life that's been born from my ministry, give glory to God. Where there has been mistakes, sin, and shortcomings, please cover them over with the grace of the gospel. Tara and I will love you and miss you and grateful that we're only 45 minutes away. We're eager to watch how God uses you and uses us together as partners in the gospel for the sake of God's glory and the greater metro area of Phoenix. One expression of our heart as Grace Church to Sovereign Grace Church. We want to present a gift to you that you'll have, Lord willing, this time next week. But in the scriptures, when God moves and God meets people in the Old Testament, they lay up memorials to commemorate God's activity. And so we want to do something for you that will commemorate this, this moment. And so we at Grace Church is purchasing and will be attempting to plant the Grace Church tree Somewhere on this property over the next week, you'll have your own Grace Church plant right here. It'll be great. (laughs) And when you see that tree, pray for us. Let it feel your worship to God. Pray for us. And Rich, please promise me you'll water it. Because if I come back to visit some Sunday and that tree's dead, I'll I'll do my best to water with the word and you just water. (laughs) 
Tara, my love, some things are so worthy that it's glorious to even attempt to try. And I feel like we're standing on top of that mountain, ready to launch off. The thought I had was, there's nobody that I'd rather fly with or crash with (laughs) than you. Thank you for walking alongside me. I wouldn't want to do this without you. And finally, to Grace Church, can I have them stand for a second? Because I want to know where they are. If you're Grace Church, if you could stand where you are. If you guys can make your way down to the front right now. Thanks, Bob, for taking leadership there. The front would be designated by this section here. And if you could turn and face me for just one moment so I could address you. Close your ears for just a moment, Sovereign Grace Church. You're my favorite church. (laughs) And I love being your senior pastor. And each one of you has my deepest respect. Each one of you has my deepest appreciation. You're not going because of me, and I know it. You're going because you believe that God has a mission yet to be fulfilled. And in his providence, he's placed it upon your hearts to be those who are numbered among the ones who leave and go. And I'm so grateful. I know this does not come without sacrifice. I know. And more importantly, God knows. And I want to pray for you as I close in prayer and pray for Sovereign Grace Church that God will make our plant grow into a vibrant tree planted by the planted by the water, whose leaves do not wither. Time has come. God sends, we go. We go with power. We go with purpose. We go with his presence. Let's pray. Father, We love you. What is happening right now is foolishness in the eyes of the world. But we know, Lord, we know we've not been tricked. We know this is your good will. And I pray, Father, for comfort and for grace and for faith and for excitement for every person who's standing here and for those a part of our church plant team that are not able to be here this morning. Fill them with your spirit, Lord, to do the work you called us to do. Give gifts to these men and women and the children. Lord, use them in the lives that we come into contact with. Lord, keep our eyes focused on you. We pray, Lord, you'd save the children of Grace Church so that the future generation will be able to attest to the glory of the gospel. And Lord, when our time has run its course, may it be said of us, we loved Jesus Christ and we were willing to sacrifice greatly for him because we knew that we had an abiding possession and a more lasting one 
than this earth and all this earth promises us. You will accomplish your work in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.